a uh, Miss Jerry. I need you to. I need Miss Jerry to move from behind Chad. Yeah, because she's probably bought them turtles for me, and I don't want him to. I'm sure you bought me something. Uh uh uh. You know, I was just sitting while we were singing, I was just thinking, I was just talking to the Lord, and I just, it just hit my mind, you know, standing there looking at Him. Put yourself in that mindset right now. You're standing looking at Jesus. What do you tell Him? What do you want to tell Him? And I just wanted, I just began to weep, just thank you, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did. He knows my junk. He knows your junk, right? He knows everything. But yet, He decided to pour His grace upon us and forgive us. Not only did He forgive us, God, y'all, but we have a God who loves us. And we have a, a God, we have a, the Bible tells us that He is not unsympathetic. He understands our pains. And we can take our pains to Him. We can take our fears and our worries. We can cast them all upon him, and he can carry them for us. He's proven himself, has he not? As we've been studying on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights through the Old Testament a lot. I, I keep seeing that over and over and over. God's proved himself to us over and over and over. We can trust in our Father to take care of whatever it is you need to lay at his feet. And I've learned in my life that sometimes we keep carrying stuff we shouldn't keep carrying. Sometimes we've got to learn to lay it down. Just lay it down and let him have it. And just give him your life. Say, Lord, I'm not carrying that anymore. I just want you to, I just want to serve you. I got to thinking all this past week, and I, it really killed me last week. To We were back and forth on that decision and all the guys, and we just, we, you know, I really hated to miss. But I've been thinking all week as we start a new year. I always think at New Year time, it's hit me, and my dad used to, when he was raising us up, he always said, I want you to, to stop and look at yourself from outside of yourself, like from another person's perspective. What do you see in that young man? What do you see that needs to be changed? You know, David cried out in Psalm, examine my heart, O Lord. Search my heart and show me what is wrong with me, right? Tell me, don't, don't search my wife's heart, my husband's heart, or my child's heart. Search my heart and show me. And each year, the President of the United States addresses a joint session of Congress, the House and the Senate, to discuss the state of the Union. And I always think of what is the state of the Union of the church. And primarily, I want to talk about the church in America and the church here where we're at today. Uh, League and Air Ministry, some of you guys follow them, and, and they put out some great resources for us. And Lifeway joined together over the last several years, probably 10 years, I think, and they've been doing these uh, they send out these questionnaires to evangelical Christians to the church, and they so it's a pretty accurate uh, poll that they they come back with. And the 2022 results, I just wrote down a few of them, says 65 percent of U.S. adults believe that humans are born innocent. Now we as Christians know what that's not biblical, and if you're here today and that you don't know that, I want you to hear this passage. You can look on the screen with me. Ephesians 2 tells us, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That cleared that up. So now if any of you believe that any human being is born innocent, you just say, no, I was wrong. Because the Bible says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the Son's of disobedience among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest so there is no debate at all zero debate if you think well I think people are born innocent you're just wrong and somebody in your life's got to look at you and lovingly tell you you're wrong. That's what the Bible says. God, let God be true and every man a liar. That's what the Bible says. Here's another one. They say, the Bible. The Bible. 66 books of the Bible, like all sacred writings, 
contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. Guess how many believe that? 53%. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 43% believe that. Agreed with that. Even though the scripture tells us in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, capital H, God, you will die in your sins. There is no debate. Jesus is eternally God. There are many people out there that claim to be Christian. We talk about this often. But they're not. People who disagree with these key things that we've talked about, you cannot be a born-again Christian and disagree with God. You're calling God a liar. You must agree with Jesus. That's what repentance means. To agree with God. I change my thinking and I turn and I go with His thinking. I agree with Him. That's what it means to be a Christian. Well, somewhere along the way, this is what's on my heart at the start of this year. And it's been piercing my heart all week. And I was back and forth with so many different little passages that I wanted to share with you. But this is what is bothering me. Somewhere along the way, many people who claim to be a Christian have decided to give up. Maybe they are asking, what's the point in preaching the gospel? The world is so bad. We see statistics like this. We see the condition of the church where it appears more and more that people just don't seem to, cont they don't seem to care about a consistent service to the church. The numbers are astonishing. Thousands of churches closed their doors last year. Thousands of churches. Not a few, thousands. I read 4,000 churches closed their doors. Now, I don't know how true that is, and I don't know that's across a lot of denominations, right? And other issues. But many churches closed their doors. I've heard, and I read online, I'm, on, I'm a part of this little pastor's group. It's all over the country. It's a private page. And it's been really good. These men are some good, good, godly men in this page. And, and they're just sharing things because they know it's a private page. And so it's, it's been really good. And, I, and these guys are sharing their heart and the things they're seeing. Well, when you get involved in something like that, you start seeing common denominators. You start seeing the same comments from men in every state in this country. And that's what they're noticing. It's no, they're noticing that people now are too busy to serve the Lord. That seems to be the number one complaint that I hear from these men every day. People are too busy to serve the Lord in His church. Then you look outside the church, what's going on in the world. People who seem to have a hate for the church. And they seem to not just hate us, but they're doing everything they possibly can through politicians to silence the church. Make no mistake about it. They don't want you to just leave them alone. They want to silence you. Canada has proven it. We talked about this last year at the end of the year when they passed that uh, law up there that if you, you speak against, if you practice conversion therapy, that is a crime in Canada. If you speak openly against sexual immorality of any sort, that is a crime in Canada. And, there, and make no mistake about it, they want it bad here in the United States. So when you see these things, and you know what it does? It makes us angry. It makes us angry at unbelievers, does it not? It makes us angry with these people. And the thing that I want to address in this church that's vitally important is don't give up. Do not grow weary. Do not forget what the Lord has commanded. And the question that we're going to have to ask ourselves today, and you're going to go home this afternoon and for the rest of this year, I want you to keep it on your mind. Do I really desire to see people saved this year? Galatians 6, 7 tells us, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. 
Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. And what popped in my mind today, and you might think, wow, where, why'd you pick this story, Derek? But I picked the story of Zacchaeus today. You know, and as a church that goes book by verse by verse through a book, a lot of times we miss some of these other stories that people who grew up in the church, we hear these same stories all year long, you know. And I remember growing up, and Zacchaeus meant a lot to me because he was a wee wee man, right? Yeah. I could relate to Zacchaeus. We used to sing the song all the time. Y'all still remember the song? You want to sing it, Teresa? I'll leave you. So Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. Y'all turn in your Bibles there and we'll read the story of Zacchaeus. In Luke 19 verse 1, it says, He entered Jericho and was passing through. Of course, he, that's speaking of Jesus. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now something we need to understand here about a tax collector is that they were hated. All right? Still are, yeah. Well, you fed right into me there. You don't know it yet. I think you all know what Jesus thinks about hate. I think we all know that Jesus does not tolerate hate. Let me give you a very straight to the point passage. 1 John 2 9 says, the one who says he is in the light, meaning you say, I'm a Christian, I've been born again, I'm in Christ. If you say he is in the light and yet hates his brother, is in darkness until now. No, you are not saved, he says, point blank. You hate your brother, you're not saved. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. It means he's in it, he's not saved, and he's continuing in a, a pattern of unbelief and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Luke tells us that this tax collector here, Zacchaeus, was rich. We already talked about it back in uh, Luke chapter 18. If y'all can, let me go look, look back on the screen with me, verse 24. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Remember the story with the rich young ruler? He was so wealthy and Jesus said, Sell all you have and give to the poor. People start telling you, I always have to tell you guys this, because you know I like for, to give you things you can use with people. You're not saved unless you go under the water. You're not saved unless you're baptized. Jesus said you've got to repent and be baptized. And then I always tell them, well, Jesus also said you need to sell all you have and give to the poor. Have you done that? See, they take things out of context. Don't let them. You know, make sure you understand the true meaning of what salvation is, right? So Jesus dealt with that rich young ruler, and he couldn't do what? He couldn't let go of his wealth, could he? And Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew what was in his heart. The Pharisees considered these tax collectors as those who did not follow the law. And we often see them mentioned all throughout the New, Te uh, New Testament, mentioned alongside of sinners. You'll see it often. Tax collectors and sinners. Prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. They accuse Jesus of eating with tax collectors and sinners. When Jesus explains church discipline in Matthew 18, this is what he tells the church. In Matthew 18, 16. 
We're dealing with a person that's in the church that's still living in sin. They won't turn from their sin. They don't seem to care about it. Now it's come to the attention of the church. We've got to do something about it. He says, if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What he is saying in that is mean treat them as someone who is unsaved. Treat them as someone who needs to hear the gospel. So tax collectors were not well liked, still aren't today, you're right. They were hated. What made them even worse, what made people hate a tax collector even worse, is that they were Jews. They were their own people. And they went and bought into a franchise. You know, they would go to Rome and, and give their money to be able to be allowed to go and tax the people. And they worked for the Romans. Here's the Romans occupying the land of Israel. The Jews hated that. And their own people went and joined up with the Romans to come back and tax their own people. So they, the Jewish people saw these tax collectors, saw Zacchaeus and Matthew and others as traitors. To their own people. The tax collectors were known to cheat the people. The Romans required a certain amount of tax. And they said, okay, this is all we want. You go and bring that to us. And anything else that you get, guess what? You get to keep it. So the tax collectors, if you know, if uh, if you owed five dollars, they come to you, they didn't just take five dollars to transfer. No, they take twenty or ten. Whatever, they could just do whatever they wanted. And the people lived in fear they had to pay the tax. So they were cheating the people. They were collecting more than they were supposed to, and they kept the extra for themselves. The key thing about Zacchaeus, remember, is he was the chief of the tax collectors, meaning he was over the other tax collectors. So it's like a pyramid scheme. They all got their money, but then they all gave him money. So he's raking off the top of everybody. So he is the chief of the tax collectors. John the Baptist had some tax collectors that come to him to be baptized. He says in Luke 3, back earlier in his book, Luke 3 verse 12, and some tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Now why does he say that? Because he knew what the tax collectors were doing. They were collecting more than they were supposed to. So he was telling them, hey, be right. Nothing wrong with paying your taxes. Jesus said what? Render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and under God what is God's. Pay your taxes. Something we, the church is going to be facing soon, I believe, in our country. I hope not. We prayed that God would protect us, but I believe that we're going to see all these churches begin to have to start paying taxes. That's what they're after. And guess what we'll do? We'll pay our taxes. You know why? Because that's what Jesus commanded us to do. You know why? This is not our kingdom. We don't belong to this kingdom. Jesus made that point very clear. So John and all the others knew what these tax collectors were doing, and they hated them. Now, I got to thinking about all the things and the things in this life, the things we see every day. You can get angry and frustrated with many people over many things. And I know I'm probably in a group where I'm. y'all don't feel that way, right? Nobody in this church gets angry or frustrated with people? Nobody, right? Yeah, thanks for being honest. We can get frustrated and angry over many things, but when people take our money, especially if you have very little of it. Charlie and I remember David. David always said, I hate money. I hate money. And I said, David, that's because you ain't got none. If you got a bunch of it, what happens to people? They start loving it more and more. They start wanting to, you know, guard it. But if you've got very little money and somebody's coming and taking it from you, that makes you even madder, doesn't it? Money is something we all need. Money is something that can control us if we're not careful. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, here he is, he's on his way. He's almost to his final day, he knows what's coming. He's going to be arrested and tortured and crucified. All the crowds are following him. He's coming down 
and he's passing through Jericho. He'll have to pass. He'll have to cross the Jordan River, where they all crossed at, and he has to pass through Jericho and through Bethany. Remember where he had raised Lazarus from the dead not long before this, back in Bethany. All those people have heard about Jesus. They've heard about his miracles, right? And here comes Jesus, and the crowds are coming through with him. And he knows what he's going to face. Jericho is the town that he enters in. Back to, your, back to chapter 19. And he entered Jericho and was passing through. And that was the second most wealthy area in all of Palestine next to Jerusalem. Jericho was a beautiful place, they tell us. Historians tell us. Absolutely beautiful. Kind of at the southern tip of the Fertile Valley. You know that's over there and they had these palm trees and roses all over the place. You can just imagine a very beautiful place. Today, <laughs> it's like in rubbles. It's not much to it at all, they say. It's about a, uh, the old Jericho, it's about a town of 20,000 people. Not much there to look at. So Jesus is on his way through there. And it's near the time of the Passover. So they, now you've got many Jews traveling from all over, headed to Jerusalem just like Jesus is. The large crowds following most of them because they're still trying to figure out, is this guy the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? Remember what Nicodemus had told him? No man can do the things that you do. Right? They've seen the miracles for the past three years. And they're thinking, maybe he is the Messiah. But they're still watching him. Because remember a few days, a couple of days from now, he's, they're going to be laying palm branches down as he comes into Jerusalem. Right? Shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, meaning that means what? Lord, save us. They believed he was the Messiah until what? Until he said, no, i got to die. Whoa, 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 time out. Our Messiah is not coming to die. Our Messiah is coming to set us free from the bondage to Rome and set up the kingdom. And he's going to make us all rich and wealthy and we'll never have any fear again. They knew the prophecies. They knew what was coming. And so they're following Jesus because of the miracles and all the talk of him being the Messiah. But then Jesus decides to put this little story of this little chief tax collector right here. At this specific time. Why? Why do we have to see the story of Zacchaeus? Little old Zacchaeus. Well, Zacchaeus, the Bible tells us here, he can't get to Jesus to see him. He was trying to see who Jesus was. You get that? Now, a picture, I remember I painted this picture to you of how they hated the tax collectors, and especially the chief tax collector. Now the large crowds are there. If you were a tax collector, and you knew that everybody in this room hated you, do you really want to walk in the middle of them? You'd probably be doing what? Avoiding them, wouldn't you? But Zacchaeus says, the Bible says here what? He wanted to see Jesus. I want you guys to see something that's happening there. Almighty God is doing a work. He don't know what's happening yet, but he knows something is happening. Something's happening in his heart. He wants to see Jesus, but he can't see Jesus. He can't get to him. The crowds had to have been in the many, many thousands of people. And he's a small man. He can't see over people. He can't see Jesus. So what does he do? He's a smart man. He got to the position he's got to, you know, he figures things out. So he runs ahead and he climbs up a sycamore tree. Now this sycamore tree is not like our sycamore trees. These were more, uh, it's other reference, uh, the Bible references them as like a mulberry tree. And they had a big wide trunk at the bottom and, and they weren't very tall trees and they'd have these big limbs. So it was a tree, a, a man or a child could just run right up it and climb up. And he's, So he knows the path that Jesus is coming. He knows that this is the main road that runs through Jericho on the way to Jerusalem. He's grown up his whole life around there. Everybody knows this is where the pilgrims come on their way to Jerusalem to the Passover. So he just runs ahead and he gets up in this tree. It might, I shouldn't say this, but I, it's popping in my mind and y'all know how I am because i got to wake you up a second. But I remember, I'm a big golfer, so I always wanted to go to Augusta. To me, that was the most beautiful. So I got to go to Augusta in 1997. And Jack Nicholas was coming, and, and me and my buddy, I said, man, Jack Nicholas is coming. I want to go see him at Amen Corner on the 12th tee box, you know. So I run over there, and nobody's over there yet, and I'm standing at the 12th tee box because I know Jack's coming, right? As soon as he finishes 11, in my mind, the simple mind, 11, you go to 12. 
So I get over there on the tee box, and here comes Jack Nicholas. And I got to say, hey, how you doing? And he said, how you doing? You know, so Jack Nicholas acknowledged me in my life. I thought that was great. So Zacchaeus, though, gets to meet somebody a whole lot more important than Jack Nicholas. He climbs up in that sycamore tree where he's pretty sure Jesus will be walking under him. And I just couldn't get it out of my mind why in the world this man, who's probably the richest in all of the era, all of the area, richer than anybody, why would he want to see Jesus? Think about the stories he's heard about Jesus. You know, why would he? he he's got everything he needs. Think about people you meet in the world out there today. I've heard Christians complaining, why do all these unbelievers get all this great stuff? They got it made. They get to camp all weekend long. They got the nicest boats and the nicest cars and the nicest everything. They're not doing anything for Jesus. Why do they get blessed and we don't? Y'all ever heard that? I hear it a lot, unfortunately. But he knows that these people hate him, yet he risks going out in the crowd. And that's what I want you to remember today. Zacchaeus, something was happening to Zacchaeus. And he risked his life. Because all it took in that kind of crowd, oh, there's a tax collector. Stick him in the back. You know, kick him, you know, let's, let's take care of this guy. Let's get rid of him, right? But he didn't. He went on. Look in verse 5 now, Luke 19, 5. When Jesus came to the plates, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. I don't know about y'all, when I looked at this first, first thing that popped in my mind was what? Jesus knew him by name. Look on the screen with me, John 10, 3. Take this personal today. No matter what you're carrying, what you're upset over, what you're burdened over, I want you to remember this always. Log this in your brain good today. Jesus knows you by name. Some denominations, people try to teach you, oh, no, 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 he's talking about the church. No, sir, not God. Not the omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing God of the universe. He knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head. I got it, Monica. Fine. He knows everything about you. He knows you by name. Watch this. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus comes to him and calls him by name. Why is he doing that? Because Jesus is eternally God. He knew who Zacchaeus was before he ever created the world. And it's his time. And he looks at his son. He looks at his child. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. And I love how Jesus tells him to hurry and come down. That's what I want to cry out to you and anybody listening today. If you're not saved, I want to cry out, hurry. Hurry and come to Jesus. Don't wait. Quit putting it off. Hurry and come down out of that world and come to Christ. Do it now. Do it now. When I grew up, we had these altar calls, you know, and I can remember the preachers just stand up there forever and ever. Man, we had to sing through just as I am. For I mean, I think we did it twice. Come, come, come. And I remember one of my cousins one time, the preacher kept saying, y'all come, y'all come. And he had just learned to make airplane wings. And he started doing the airplane down the aisle, you know, and his daddy was chasing him around. But it, today is the day of salvation. Jesus said, today I must stay with you. Now obviously we know he's talking, he's coming, he's going to come and stay with him. But he's also meaning a lot more than just a physical stay with him, isn't he? Today is the day of your salvation. Today, the day you hear His voice, you hear His voice calling you today, you come to Him. You let go of this world. I'm telling you, it's got nothing for you. This world is controlled by Satan. It's nothing but lies. And the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he's come to do. Come to Christ. Come all the way to Him. That's why the book of Hebrews, he tells those Jewish people, don't go back to Judaism. Come all the way to Christ. He's all you need. He's done it all. He kept the law for you. He's done everything perfectly. All you got to do is come to Him. That's it. Zacchaeus, today is the day. And look at verse 6, guys. What did Zacchaeus do? And he hurried and came down and received Him gladly. Zacchaeus heard his shepherd's voice. How many of you remember that day? 
Do you remember hearing your master's voice? Do you remember, I need Jesus? I need to come to Christ. You remember that? He hurried to come and received him gladly. He was changed immediately and received Jesus. A lot of people like to talk about accepted Jesus Christ. And I don't care. I'm not splitting hairs. But I like to say we received him. Why? Because he's a gift. He's a gift to us. He gave Christ to us. He hurried and came down and received him gladly. He was changed immediately. Look at verse 7. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now this is why I know when I got into what the Lord has put on my heart. Right here. He drifted on me. Focus on this verse right here and listen to me. Look at the people's reaction to a man receiving Jesus. Here is a man who's the most despised man in town. He's so despised he's not allowed in the synagogues anymore. They won't eat with him anymore. He is stolen from the people. They won't have anything to do with this man. That's how much he's hated. And here the Messiah is going to stay with him and save his eternal soul from an eternal damnation and an eternal hell, a literal hell. Where is the excitement from this, for this wicked man being saved? Where's the excitement? I remember when we had some baptism services this past year, and I remember thinking, every Christian in this community should be overwhelmed with joy that a sinner has come home, has been saved. The angels in heaven rejoice. Why is the church not rejoicing? When I talked with Mr. Tommy and he gave his life to Christ, I mean, I was just overwhelmed with joy. And the kids and so many this year, I, I'm just, I mean, where's the church at? Where's the excitement? The church should be embracing these new Christians and loving them and welcoming them into the family of God. What else in this God-forsaken planet, this miserable existence of a life that we live in this wicked, sinful world, what else is more important to you than sinners getting saved? Think about it. Did you personally let any of these new Christians that you know, whether it was in another church or this church, you read about it on Facebook, you saw their baptism videos, you saw their testimonies, whatever. Did you go to them and let them know how happy you were for them? Or were you like these people? This is my fear. This is my challenge to the church. This is what I want to start off 2023 with all of us thinking. Would you grumble? You think of the person in this community, because I know we don't know people in other communities, but you think of the person that hits your mind that is a wicked, vile person that you can't stand. Think of a person that if they come into this church, you don't want to associate with them. Think of somebody in this community that you're like, well, you know what, I ain't helping serve them right. They deserve what they get. I could sit here all day long and tell you comments that we all, and I'm putting myself in the same boat, we have all done the people that we don't want to deal with. And if Jesus Christ saved their soul, would you be happy for them or would you grumble? These people grumbled. They grumbled saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Verse 8. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Here's this Zacchaeus stealing from the people. Hated by the people. Just like that, instantly, he's changed into a whole new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. 
Zacchaeus immediately, when Jesus spoke to him, knew in his heart what he had done wrong and what he needed to do. Jesus doesn't say in this passage here, now Zacchaeus, you know you've been stealing from all these people. You know you need to go and, and make things right. See, every Jew knew the law. Look on the screen with me, Numbers chapter 5. Numbers chapter 5 verse 6 says, Speak to the sons of Israel. When a man or a woman commits any of the sins of mankind, acting unfaithfully against the Lord, and that person is guilty, then he shall confess his sins which he has committed, and he shall make restitution in full for his wrong, and add to it one-fifth of it, and give it to him who he has wronged. Here's little Zacchaeus building his own little empire on earth. He was the chief of the tax collectors. And in one moment, Jesus Christ called his name and he was willing to lay it all down. He was willing to give it all back. He didn't just say, okay, Jesus, you got me. I'll give it back. What did he do? He said, I'll give back four times as much. Now, if you read in other passages in the Old Testament the law, that was only required for people who had really violently done something very wicked and, and, and taken from people and hurting people. Then they were required to give back four times. He hadn't even done that. He hadn't violently taken it from people. He hadn't killed people or hurt people. We don't see that in Scripture, but Nick, but uh, Zacchaeus is taking it one step further. Why? Because he's feeling the guilt in his heart. What does Jesus bring? The Holy Spirit comes into the world to bring conviction. He convicts men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. As soon as Jesus Christ called his name Zacchaeus, he knew in his heart what he had done. And instantly he responds with, I've got to do something. I've got to do something. It made me think of, what do we do after we get saved? What did you do when you got saved? Did it cross your mind how much you want to give back to the Lord? Did it cross your mind? That uh, recently, or maybe even hearing this today, that you know what? I really hadn't done much after Jesus saved my soul. I give him an hour a week. Or do we think in our minds, do we take all that he's given us and say, Lord, everything you've given me to this point in life, everything, I want you to take it and use it for your glory. It all belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to do the best I can to manage it for you, but I want you. Can you honestly say that in your heart? Lord, everything that I have, I know is a gift from you. James tells us every good and perfect gift comes from what? From above. Lord, it all belongs to you. How can I use what you've given me to grow your kingdom? Verse 9, and Jesus said to him, wow. Think about it, guys. He's the most hated man in town. He's building his own empire. Just like that, Jesus changes his heart. And just like that, he recognizes what he needs to do. He needs to go and make things right. He's going to give back all that he's taken and four times as much. Meaning he's fixing to deplete his bank account to make things right with the people in that community. You know, when Jesus looked upon that, you know what Jesus says in verse 9? After, after Zacchaeus said that, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Now Jesus already knew Zacchaeus' heart. But why does he wait to say, Today salvation has come to you? And why does he announce it? Why does Jesus have to say anything at all? Jesus already knew his heart. Jesus announces it after Zacchaeus says all that he's going to do. After Zacchaeus acknowledges his sin and, and begins to show fruit of what? A changed heart, a changed mind, a whole new creation, right? When, Nick, when Zacchaeus comes forth and says all of that, that's when Jesus cries out and says, Today this salvation has come. Why? Because he sees the fruit of salvation he sees a changed mind he sees a changed heart he sees a changed behavior do not be deceived I read to you earlier God is not mocked if you say you're born again 
There will be fruit coming from it. There's no such thing as a non-fruit bearing Christian. I've said this for years down here. You may have little raisins on your limbs. But there's something coming. There's going to be fruit of it. Many people today, and I think this is a big one, they may think, you know what, well, Derek, I'm a quiet person. I don't like to be seen or heard or anyone to really talk about me. Those days are over, my friend, if you've been born again. I am not ever going to let off of that, of that as long as I'm still alive. Because I know we all have a past. And I know we've been hurt by many people. And I know we have insecurities and fears. Every one of us. You think I don't have insecurities and fears? We all have them. But guess what we're all looking at? Every one of us. The same. We're all looking at the same cross of Christ. You didn't get a different Jesus than I got. You didn't get a different Holy Spirit than I got. You didn't get a different Bible than I got. It don't matter where you've been. It don't matter what your fears are, your insecurities, or your bad habits. Every one of us have a responsibility to the same Jesus Christ who carried our cross to Calvary. Zacchaeus immediately made it, did something. Not for his salvation, right? So look what he says there in the end of this verse. Because he too is a son of Abraham. Jesus says salvation has come because Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. What does that mean? Well, he's not talking about a racial issue here. He's not talking about his bloodline because he's a Jew of the descendant of Abraham. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying because he's a son of Abraham, meaning he has the faith that Abraham had. Look on the screen. In Romans 2, Paul clears all this up in Romans. Romans 2, 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. See that? Inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart. Do you think those people were running around slicing their hearts? No, this is a spiritual thing. By the Spirit, he says there clearly, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. He's a son of Abraham. Meaning, he has the same saving faith that Abraham had. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him righteousness. How are we saved? The same way. In the New Testament, same way. Saved by grace? What? Through faith. Same way. The Old Testament Jews were saved the same way we are saved in the New Testament. It's all by faith. And that's why he says there, he could see it. He saw the change. Why? Because he's God. He made the change in the man, first and foremost. But, yet, but look what he made Zacchaeus do. He didn't tell him to do it, did he? But he waited for Zacchaeus to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give back all that I've done. Because he knew instantly in his heart what he had done wrong. And then the last verse. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This was the whole reason for Jesus stopping on this road that day in Jericho. To deal with this little wee little man, Zacchaeus, this chief tax collector. Because he wanted to demonstrate to all of his followers then and us today that this is why Jesus Christ came into the world. To save sinners. And guess what we are to be doing? Seeking who is lost. So I asked you in the beginning today, do you desire to see people saved this year? Or will you allow their wickedness? Will you allow their foolishness? Will you allow their blindness, their hardness of hearts, their hate for the church and the hate for your Christ? Will you allow all of these thoughts that you have for lost people in your community, in your workplace? People that you think, well, it's too late for them, Derek, they, I give up. I've tried and tried and tried. They won't listen. Will you allow your heart to get hardened to the point that you will not go to them? You will not continue to give them the gospel? 
I think sometimes we, we uh, when I was growing up, people used to say, they won't listen, so you dust your feet and move on. You know what I've learned recently? Some people, you're getting really good at dusting your feet and before you ever give the message. Don't dust your feet before you go in their house. You got to go in there first. And if they reject, there's a time to move on. You'll know that in your discernment and in your heart. But don't give up before you've ever even tried. Don't just assume that the most wicked, wretched person in this community, we see the drug addiction, we see the broken homes, we see the immoralities, we see all of this, going, this stuff going on, and it's probably in some of your families. It's in mine. We see it, don't we? Don't have the heart that says, I don't care, I give up. You keep on fighting for these people. Keep on praying. Keep on inviting them to church. Keep on studying to show yourself approved. Keep on trying to give them the truth. And I'm going to close with this verse, Romans 10, 13. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are you excited to hear somebody do that? Really? Are you excited to hear someone that you know call upon the name of the Lord? I can tell y'all, I've had great joys in my life. Birth of children. Love and family and all the many different things, blessings God's given me. But there's nothing that compares to kneeling down with a person and hearing them cry out to God to forgive me my sins. And I accept you. I receive you, Lord, as, my, as Lord over my life. There's nothing. I'm telling you, nothing compares to that. If it does, your priorities are off. Because that's a soul. Zacchaeus was a soul that was headed for hell. The person that's in your mind right now that you've got to go out and deal with this week, they're a soul that's headed for hell. And that will never end. They're, the eternal torment will never end for them. You'd have to really hate somebody to allow that to happen without he trying to rescue them from the flames of hell. So he says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? Here's where you come in. And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. So, are you excited to start off 2023? Go get your feet done. Get your feet ready. See Chad on, he'll help you. Get your feet ready to go into this wicked world and bring them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you all this year is that you get to hear somebody call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Let's pray. Father, please, please, please bless us all with that opportunity to see someone saved. Father, you bless us with physical things here, a nice building and, Lord, comfortable seats to sit in and our homes and our vehicles, so many things, Lord. But I pray that you that you'd prick our hearts, that we'd give it all up to see a person saved. That we'd lay it all down. That we would learn from Zacchaeus that you have changed our hearts in such a way that we would be willing to give it all up to show you how serious we are about trusting you and serving you in the remainder of our days here on this earth. Father, thank you for the example of Zacchaeus. I believe we'll get to go talk to that little man in heaven. Thank you for saving his soul. Thank you for putting this story in the scripture so that we would leave here today and that no matter how wicked a person looks in our community that the next time we see a dirty wretched filthy wicked sinner in our community that we think it could be a Zacchaeus and that, and that we were all that we are all willing to go to him believing that you may call them by name and bring them out of the pig pen they're in and save their eternal soul and I pray all these things in Jesus name.